uh, in our lives. Jeremiah chapter 33, and uh, we're going to look at, uh, at one verse, uh, verse number 25. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse number 25. And it does sort of tie with our, our continued theme of walking with God. Uh, it wasn't intended for that, but it did end up going in that direction. Uh, but it, it's building upon revival. And uh, we tried to uh, give a, a foundation on Sunday about, you know, is it something I'd like to have revival? I'd love to have revival. And, and I think God really uh, is doing a work in each of our hearts individually. I mean, there's, there's a, such a, a sweet spirit, tenderness of heart of each of us as we seek to have God speak to our hearts. And, and sometimes, and you know the thing about God, God knows that those very difficult areas, He's gentle. He is. God's gentle in dealing with us in these areas. But I want to help us build on the decisions. And again, revival is not something that you can schedule. We schedule on our calendar as a church and say, here's fall revival, and here's winter revival, and here's, you know, a hometown revival. Revival cannot be scheduled, uh, but uh, there's, there's times that we will schedule revival. Revival is a work of God that begins in our hearts, and it doesn't end on a Tuesday night. Uh, we had a great, great Monday and Tuesday, and a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, but revival isn't over just because that revival part of our uh, schedule time is, is no longer uh, there. Revival is something, it's, it's sort of like an appetizer. You go to a restaurant, you eat an appetizer, and uh, it sort of gets you an appetite for the main course. And the main course is just growing closer to God, getting closer to God in our walk with God. And so revival is, is not necessarily the highlight, though it is a highlight of an occasion. It's not the pinnacle. It's not the climax. It's just that point in our life to where God creates that excitement and that, that desire, that appetite for something greater with God, a greater relationship with God, a greater walk with God, a greater intimacy with God that we then build upon. So this, these last few days, uh, I want us to build upon that and to help us to learn to maximize uh, this thing of, of revival. Look in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse number 25. Well, just this one verse, Jeremiah 33, verse 25. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. What shows that little phrase there? I've appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. Father, help us tonight that we would uh, learn just something that would uh, help us uh, on this revival journey uh, that we're on, that we've begun. And uh, it's not just an event, though it was a wonderful event. And it's just not a, a scheduled time, though it was a great time that was scheduled that we could have revival. Uh, but Lord, it's a journey we begin, and we've just started it. We've just begun that journey. And uh, Lord, my desire is that we would then uh, take uh, that which you've worked in our hearts and that which you're working in our hearts, and uh, Lord, that you'd build upon it in Jesus' name, amen. The Word of God through Jeremiah records for us that there are fixed laws in heaven and in earth. There's fixed laws in heaven and earth. That's what the Bible says, uh, if I have not, what, appointed the, what, the ordinance is. And ordinances is the law. It, it's, it's, it's etched and granted. I mean, it, it's unchangeable. It, it's, it's there. It's the ordinances of heaven and earth. And so this means that there are fixed laws that God uh, has uh, set up uh, for us uh, that, uh, that apply to us all. If you're saved, if you're lost. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what, when you were born, what, what, you know, if you're 80 years old or it was 300 years ago or 1,000 years ago or uh, Lord Terry's, you know, 100 years more uh, from beyond us. But uh, these laws are fixed and uh, none of us can violate these laws. Uh, obviously, some of the laws uh, that we have is the law of gravity. And, uh, you know, you can say uh, everything you want that you don't believe in the law of gravity and say, I can fly or I can do this. And you walk off a roof and, you know what, there's, you end up doing something. It's going to, the law of gravity, it's going to, the, the, the fall uh, is going to be there. Other laws include the laws of motion. The laws of motion. Uh, one conclusion drawn from the laws of motion is that an object at rest tends to stay at rest. That's a law. And as well as going on to say, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. And so alongside this is the fact that it takes less force 
to keep a moving object in a state of motion than the force required to move an object at rest. And so uh, if, if something is, is stationary at rest, it takes more energy to move something that's not moving, and it takes less energy to move something that is moving. And, and so we see the, the law of, of gravity, we see the, the law of motion. Now, uh, from Romans chapter 1, let, let, let me give you, let's, let's turn there real quickly. In Romans chapter 1, uh, in verse number 20, in Romans chapter 1, in verse number 20, we see again, we learn that the natural things of God were established to teach us divine truths. And so a parable, I'll let you get there, Romans chapter 1, parables were earthly stories Farming, uh, you know, uh, sowing seed, you know, uh, uh, you know, things of that nature. It was it was earthly stories that had a spiritual truth. There was some divine information that you can glean, glean from that, from the, the spiritual truth. So similar to what I talked about on Sunday when I talked about uh, the uh, uh, do you love football or do you like football? And so that was that was just a, a, an earthly story. But we gave, it, we gave it a spiritual insight that was very beneficial for us. And we, we, you, you see that all the time uh, as we live life. And so we see then in this passage of Scripture that the natural things of this world, including the natural laws of this world, are given to us so that we can glean some spiritual truths. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse number 20. The Bible says, um, oh, go to verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Him. Notice how verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now that doesn't make sense. The invisible things are clearly seen. Well, invisible means you can't see it. Clearly seen means it's very obvious to see. So God is teaching us something that that which is invisible can be clearly seen in divine truths. Look what it says. Uh, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so God says, even though there's laws that maybe cannot be seen and understood, uh, those laws are given. The ordinance of heaven and earth, the natural laws of heaven and earth, were given to us to glean some divine truths some divine insights that God wants us to, to learn. And so in other words, there's a spiritual application uh, to these natural laws, ordinances. So taking into account the law of momentum. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, uh, the next couple of, of times as we talk on this is the law of momentum, uh, which is tying to the law of motion, but folks in particular of momentum. Now in our walks with God, it's easier for us to keep our spiritual walk with God going when we're steadily, consistently reading our Bible, when we're consistently praying, when we're consistently obeying the words of God. It's much easier to walk with God and continue walking with God if you are currently walking with God. But if you're not walking with God, it takes so much more effort to start reading your Bible. Uh, but it takes a lot less effort to continue reading your Bible if you've already are in motion and you've already somewhere along the line started reading your Bible and now it's becoming a part of your lifestyle. And so uh, the, the important thing is that we've got to get things in motion. Uh, the most difficult part of anything is getting things in motion. And uh, But once things get in motion and we start moving, it becomes much, much easier to continue moving once we started that initial move. And so in relation to revival, uh, we want God to begin to do a work to move in our midst, to move in, in our hearts uh, individually. And as God begins to move, and the hardest part uh, for God to do is to get us to move from a stationary position, to get us in motion uh, when we're stagnant, when we're standing still, when there's no movement at all. But once God, through revival, and begins to re-energize, rejuvenate, bring back to life, and it begins to move us again. Uh, once that movement starts, we don't want that movement to stop uh, because the law of motion or the law of momentum uh, is going to kick in in a period of time that will be very beneficial for us, and uh, your walk with God will become so much more 
easier, take a lot less effort uh, if you're continually, consistently doing that versus, well, I've never read my Bible very consistently. I don't pray consistently. Well, to start uh, is going to be your most difficult part of walking with God. And uh, once you start and then consistently follow through on what you started each day, each step, uh, will become a little bit more easier, will require a little bit less effort, a little bit less energy on your part because you've got this law of motion, this law of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, momentum that's in your life. And so as we start with revival, uh, with revival, God begins to do a work in our hearts and uh, we open up, we draw a circle, say, God, I, I, want, I, I, I would like to have revival. I would love to have revival. And God begins to reveal some things in my heart that need changing. God begins to work in my life. And uh, I begin to deal with some areas of my life that maybe I've not dealt with. God begins to bring up some areas of my life that maybe I put aside and progressive and puts it in front of me. And the hardest part is to start dealing with some of those things, to start uh, working on some of those things. But once motion begins, once the motion begins, the law of motion, God says, I've established the ordinances of heaven and earth. And uh, he says, listen, uh, I want you to take these laws of, of, of nature, law of gravity, law of motion, uh, you know, the law of uh, momentum. I want, to, I want to allow that to be a spiritual truth that will help us in our walk with God, or in particular, uh, these decisions that we are not just made, but we're making uh, in regards to uh, revival. And so uh, the Christian life should be active and growing. But many times we're, we're in a rut. We find ourselves sort of just, and in baseball term, uh, in a slump. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're hitting the ball, but it seems like you're, you're always hitting to, to someone. And there's, you're fi not finding the holes, and, and you're not seeing the ball very good. And, and you're just sort of in a slump. You're just in a rut uh, in your life. You walk with God, and, and, uh, things, and, and uh, you're just sort of struggling, maybe, in some areas of your life. And so you're stuck in a spiritual rut. And uh, why? You've lost your momentum. You've lost your momentum in some area of your life and you've just come to a stop. And uh, as long as you're moving, it, was mu it required much less energy to keep the movement moving. Then once you stop, uh, now you've got to exert much more energy, much more effort to get it started again. And guess what Satan wants you to do? He wants to slow us down to a stop. And that's why we don't want to stop, because then we get in a rut. We lose the law of momentum. And when you lose the law of momentum, you lose a very powerful tool that God wants to use to help us grow in our Christian life, progress in our Christian life, and excel in our Christian life. And Satan knows that, so he doesn't want us to take that law. It's the law of momentum. And I'll give you just earthly examples of that here in a moment. And so to live successful... Uh, and so revival is all about starting anew and then moving forward with God in greater mass with more urgent uh, velocity. It's about regaining what? Your spiritual momentum. And uh, I'm in need of revival. Why? I've lost some momentum. I've lost some movement. And I, I've, I've slowed down to a point where I've stopped in some areas. And when I've stopped, boy, it seems like I'll never be able to get this back. I'm in a rut. I'm in a slump. And so I need to have uh, uh, moving forward again. And so the successful, uh, to, have a, to live a successful and impactful, uh, influential Christian life uh, requires first uh, to use 10 units of effort to produce one unit of results. Let me say it again. So when you're, at a, when you're stopping point in your life, it's going to require 10 units of effort to produce one unit of result. Whatever that unit, unit is, you know, the time, the energy, the expense, whatever, whatever it might be. Now, once your momentum kicks in, uh, you'll then produce uh, the 10 units uh, of results with one unit of effort. And so we got to get the momentum going. And so it's like synergy. Synergy is a word we don't use. It is in the scripture. The Bible talks about horses. And he says, one horse, I don't know the exact number, but it's similar to this. One horse will chase a hundred, two horses will chase a thousand. Well, wait a minute. If one horse can chase a hundred, then two horses should be able to chase two hundred. Makes sense. But God says, and, and, and synergy tells us, that one force working by itself can do 
this 100 chase 100 but two working together don't double their output but it maximizes to uh, almost an infinite potential when you're working together. So one horse chases 100, two horses chase 1,000. That's called synergy. And so when you get uh, the, those, those two working together, then those two can accomplish much, much more than what could be accomplished individually by yourself. And so that's what we're talking about in regard. So it takes two units of, of energy. It takes two un, or 10 units uh, of time. It takes 10 units of cost to produce one unit. But once you get the movement going, once you get momentum going, it now takes uh, one unit of energy to produce 10 units of results. And so it's flipped. And so Satan knows the power potential that, that is there. It's in Scripture. It's a law. It's a law of motion. It's a law of momentum. And God says the laws are given so that we can learn some divine spiritual truths. And so when we start this thing of revival and we gain God through revival begins to move us in some areas. Don't lose the momentum of the movement of what God's doing in your heart, in your life, in your, in your, in your, in your heart, in your, in your mind. To move you to serve God, to move you to walk with God, to move you to different areas of spiritual growth in your life. He's moving you. The hardest part is to get you started. But now through revival, when that movement begins to, to begin, it becomes much less effort that is required to accomplish what you've accomplished in getting started. It requires so less effort. And so far too many Christians want to use one unit of effort and expect 10 units of results. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. you got to get started. So uh, the, the message tonight, uh, the introduction of our message tonight, and we'll build on the next uh, me couple of messages, is this. The power of just starting. The power of just starting. And that's why Satan doesn't want you to start. Uh, he discouraged you. Well, why even try? I've tried before. You've come forward making a decision. I'm not going to make a decision. Why? Because when I tried before, I failed. That's why some of you don't like New Year's resolution because it's so discouraging. Because I've tried it before. I've tried it before. And I never succeed. I never succeed. So you, you, you convince yourself, I'm just not going to start. But God said, listen, there's power in starting. But the hardest part is to start. And so he's saying, I want you to start. Now, let me give you a Bible story that'll, that'll bring all this together. Go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And, and again, I'm not going to be able to cover hardly anything. I don't want to. I just want to take 30 minutes, and uh, we'll be done. And uh, we've had a good week, and, and I'm not here to, 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 to uh, uh, compete or undo or whatever was done by Brother Domley. I want to just sort of compliment uh, what was done, and to give us some truths and nuggets that will really help us take what God is doing, not did, but what God is doing in our hearts and build upon it so that we don't lose the, 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 the law of motion, that we don't lose the law of momentum, and that God wants to do something far greater than just that, that uh, starting point that you have. And yes, it took a lot of effort, took a lot of energy, but God says that the starting point is always the hardest. Starting a diet and starting a this and exercise and starting a this. The hard part is starting. And then as you begin to consistently do what you started, it becomes a little bit more easier, easier. Why? Because the law of, uh, of motion, the law of momentum kicks in. Now, look in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. And let me, let me give you a couple of verses here. Go to, let's go down to verse number 33. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 33. Go to verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight uh, with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine. So we're talking about Goliath, right? And uh, here, uh, the, the context of the story. And, and, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but what? You're just a youth, you're a young guy, and he's a man of war. From, I mean, he's got years of experience fighting. Verse 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. 
Thy servant, verse 36, slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now David had the momentum with him. He was on a, a roll. And I mean, he had momentum. He had started the move. God had begun to work in his heart. And so notice it says, it says in verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw, the, the lion, hey, he got moving, all right? God was using him, protecting the sheep there. He started moving, got victory over the lion. He got victory over the paw, the bear. He comes in and says, now, God's going to what? He's going to deliver me out of the hand of this field shame. That's spiritual momentum. He didn't go from nothing and fight the Goliath. He started with the, the lion. He got victory. God gave him the victory. He started with the bear, got the bear. God gave him the victory. And now this Philistine cursing God, defying God, he had momentum. God gave one victory. God gave another victory. And now the momentum's going. And he kept it going. What was the result? Here's a young teenage boy brought down this giant, got the victory. Others were running and hiding, uh, scared to death. But David used momentum and went forward and did something that none of the, the army could do, none of the real seasoned soldiers could do. But here's a, a, a shepherd boy, a teenage shepherd boy, but used, uh, used the, the, the law of motion, the law of momentum, and he took, I, I killed a, a lion, I killed a bear, and this Philistine, God's able to deliver him into my hands. Why? Because he was using this law. He was on a roll. I mean, boy, he was on a hidden street. I mean, he was in the zone. He was ready to go. He felt the power of God. He felt the presence of God. And he knew that God would do something great. Why? Because he was using momentum. Now, if he didn't face the bear, if he hadn't faced the lion, and he was just there doing nothing, tending the sheep, and fighting no battles. Then when he delivered the, the, the food and victuals uh, for his brothers and heard that, that lion, he wouldn't have been victorious. Why? There was no momentum. There had been no courage. There had been no strength. But the power of momentum was that which allowed him to move forward. See, the God that helped me, David said, in the paw, in the past, is able to deliver me in the future. Momentum is what brings impact. It's what makes a difference. Greater the momentum greater the impact and so the, the the goal is what once you start moving once you start movement begins and once the movement begins that movement picks up and picks up and picks up and the greater impact the greater difference you'll make when you allow the momentum to carry you through oh we had revival that was wonderful Monday Tuesday revival is over no don't miss out on what God has done to move your heart in an area to move your life in an area let that movement the hardest part is start now let that movement begin to build up its uh, momentum. And that momentum will build and grow and grow and grow. And the impact will be greater and greater. Imagine. So momentum is a powerful force in nature and in life. Imagine, if you would, an avalanche. We've seen the pictures. Cascading down a mountain slope. Boy, you see that. It just starts off just as, as a little nothing. And uh, I saw a, a video I was watching, and a guy was filming this thing. And, uh, I mean, it just sort of looked a little, way off in the distance, just sort of a, a little, you know, just a soft little uh, it's cascading of the snow. And then little by little, boy, that thing began to collect more, and began to collect more, and it came faster. Back. And here's a guy, and my wife said, that guy's still there. He's, run, he, she's going, uh, run, get out of there. And he's watching it, he's watching it, and then all of a sudden, you know, the camera, you know, the phone or whatever he's using, begins to shake and whatever else. And, uh, and then you see, the snow go up over him. Who knows what happened? I mean, I guess he survived or wouldn't have uploaded the video uh, on uh, YouTube. And uh, but uh, but it, you know he was there and saw what it was. It started off so simple. It, it's no threat, no nothing. But that avalanche began uh, to come. Uh, you see uh, the power of uh, momentum. How about this? Think of a crew team slicing through the water as a rowing cadence together. You see momentum intensifies forward motion but you got to start 
You got to start moving forward and you got to start doing right and you got to start your walk with God and you got to start where you don't want to start because that's the hardest part is to start. But once you start, momentum intensifies the, 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 the speed of forward motion. Let me give you some, some verses here. Go to, go to Psalm uh, 84, verse number 7. Psalm 4, 84 and verse number 7. I'll give you just three or four verses real quick. Psalm 84. So momentum intensifies forward motion. So I don't just want to walk with God. I, I want my walk with God to, uh, to, to increase in, in motion. I want it to intensify. I want it to ma be magnified. I want it to increase. Uh, look in uh, Psalm 84 verse 7. Uh, notice what he said. Talking about momentum. All right. Intensifying what? Forward motion. And uh, now, I'm focused on forward motion, but momentum can work in a negative way too, as we all know. And uh, you can allow, uh, sin can create motion and momentum where you, man, you're going the wrong direction and uh, as well. But we're focused on the positive here tonight. Psalm 84, 7, our revival decision. Bible says what? They go from what? Strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeared before God. That's momentum. They go from strength to to strength. Why would you need to go strength to strength? Because it's building. The power of God is building. They're going, they started. The hardest part is to start doing right. The hardest part is to start and do the first step. The hardest part is just to start. But once you start, the laws of God kick in. The ordinances of heaven and earth kick in. And if we don't tap into it, we miss the potential of that forward motion intensifying with less efforts. But accomplishing so much more. Let me give you another verse. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. And verse, uh, verse number 17. So we got in uh, uh, Psalm 84. Uh, it says they go from what? Strength to strength. What is that? That's, that's momentum. That's the, law of mo that's the law of momentum. What? Boy, I I'm strong. But I'm stronger now. I'm stronger now. I'm stronger now. I'm, I'm an avalanche. I'm coming forward. Boy, that power's building. Momentum. Romans 1.17. Romans 1, 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith. As it's written, the just shall live by faith. What's that? That's momentum. Strength to strength. Momentum. Faith to faith. Momentum. I mean, it's building. It's, the hardest part is to start trusting God with your finances. The hardest part is to start trusting God with your health. The hardest part is to start trusting God during the hard times of life. But once you start, you go from faith to faith. Strength to strength. Let me give you another verse. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So we're talking about the law, the ordinances of heaven and earth. God has designed the laws of nature, the laws of the land, and, uh, and there's nothing that can change it. There's nothing that can alter it. And uh, God says, why don't you take the, the spiritual application of my laws, as Romans 1.20 says, and why don't you take that and apply it to your life? It's there for your benefit, for your advantage, for revival. Not just to be one-time decision. Not just to be in a, a two-night event. Not just to be a scheduled time in your life. But it creates the movement. It starts something. And most folks never follow through on what decisions they make in the revival because they start and Satan gets them to stop. And they don't maximize the wonderful potential of that forward movement, begin to, to accelerate, to begin to move forward faster uh, with a much more greater impact uh, and a less effort that has to be exerted. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all... With open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Are changed in the same image from what? Glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's that? That's momentum. Hey, we've gone from strength to strength. From faith to faith. From glory to glory. Why? Because it's building. It's building. Oh, you start living your life to give glory to God. You start living your life to magnify God. But once you start, your life really begins to glorify God. It really begins to avalanche and magnify God. But you've got to start somewhere. The hardest part is to start. The starting point requires the most effort, the most energy, the most dying to self, the most putting, a, you know, putting yourself, taking your cross and following me. But once you start and the movement begins, the effort becomes much less 
needful and the results become much more evident in our lives. Let me give you another verse. Go to, real quick. Go to, uh, to Psalm 18. Go to Psalm 18. Back to David again. And we start with David there in, in 1 Samuel. Look also in Psalm 84. But David says here in Psalm 18, verse uh, number 37. So we'll come back to Samuel in a moment. I want to show you something here, what happens. But look um, uh, in Psalm 18, verse 37. David says, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Keep on. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have, verse 38. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. What's that? This is momentum. He didn't just overtake them, but he gained the momentum. And he beat them so much that they could not rise again. Many of us would say, well, you know what? They're running. They're, they're gone. I don't have to worry about it. He said, well, I'm building momentum. I'm not going to lose the movement I've got. He said, I pursued them. He said, I went after them, uh, uh, my enemies. And then he said, I overtook them. And then, uh, and then neither did I turn again. Till they were, he said, I didn't just capture them. And said, all right, good risk. Uh -uh. My movement's going. I'm not going to stop the the movement I've made, I, I overtake them. But I'm also going to do what? He goes on to say, but I'm going I'm to make sure they're consumed. And so I've wounded them. What? So they were not able to rise. Too often we get victory over our sin, but we don't excel and go beyond that. And our sin rises up again because we're satisfied. We got victory for one day, but we didn't take the movement and the, the motion and the momentum to destroy it so it can never rise again. And, we all, and then what happens? It rises again. He goes, oh, yeah, I got victory. I've been good for a week or so now. And then David said, uh -uh. I, I, I pursued them, overtook them. I, 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 I consumed them, and I made sure they were wounded, and they would not rise uh, from under my feet. What's he saying? I took the movement, and I, and I momentum. I used that momentum in a positive way. Now, he didn't just overtake them. He made sure they would never rise. Now, let's go back to the story, and I'll be done with this in regards to Samuel. So take your Bibles now go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. And so we, we were in 1 Samuel a moment ago. Got five minutes. 1 Samuel. And now I want you to go to 2 Samuel. And as we look at 2 Samuel, I want you to notice something uh, that, uh, that happens. 2 Samuel chapter number 8. 2 Samuel chapter number 8. Let me just back up where we were. So David had momentum going, right? Man, he was in the zone, as we call it in sports. I mean, he was on his game. And I mean, it seemed like every, every at bat, he got a hit. And I mean, as a pitcher, every throw, I mean, it was right there. Uh, in football, I mean, it was just sort of like he was zoned in. I mean, he had it. He was on his A game, as we would call it. I mean, he had it going together. Momentum was going. Now, so he, he uh, killed the, the, the lion by, because God delivered him uh, under his hand. Killed the bear. God delivered him. And he said, and God will deliver this. And sure enough, boy, old Goliath came down. He took that sword, boy, cut his head off, and uh, let the momentum keep going. Now, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter number 8. Let's read with me. And after this, verse 1. It came to pass, well, the first three verses. I want you to notice now, victory after victory after victory after victory. He wasn't going to be settled with one victory. He said, man, I'm finally getting some victory. I'm finally started. The movement's going. I want this movement to keep going because it's going to build and build. It's going to get easier. Why? Because it's a law of momentum. And he said, I don't want to stop. Look at the victories that kept coming. And after this, first three verses, chapter 8, 2 Samuel, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And, took, and David took Methgema out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David smote also Hadazir, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at, uh, at uh, uh, River Euphrates. And David took from him thousands of chariots and 700 horsemen and 20,000 footmen. And David huffed all the chariots and horses. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to Sukkur, I mean, David slew the Syrians, 2 and 20,000, verse 5. I mean, you read through here. David is on a roll. Man, he's having one victory after another victory. I mean, enemies are coming from around. He's not just going to them. They're coming to fight him. And man, he's wiping them out. He's using momentum in a powerful way. Now go down to verse 7. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, verse 7. 
Bible says, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadazir and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Bethel, uh, and from Beda, uh, and from Betroia, uh, cities of Hadazir, King David took what? Exceeding much breath. Listen, wherever David went, he had victory. Man, whoever he faced, he utterly destroyed. I mean, he wiped them out, twenties of thousands, and took their chariots and took all they had. I mean, he is in his game. He is in his zone. I mean, he is using momentum and realizing the potential of what impact and, and victories is his as a result. Now, look in verse 11. The Bible says, which also King David did, dedicated the Lord with the silver and the gold, uh, which he had dedicated uh, of all the nations which he subdued, of uh, Samaria. And then it goes down and talks about uh, the uh, verses here, and David uh, sat with him in the name we return in verse number 13, smiting of the Syrians in the valley of salt, and, and he put garrisons in Edom, and go, all these different things, the victories that took place as a result of this. And then we see, as Brother Domi talked about, these would be called what? A mountain. Huh? Battles on the mountain. Boy, one victory after another victory after another victory. Well, while on the battle, while on the mountain, victory after victory, momentum's going. When kings go forth to battle, David didn't go. He stayed home. He didn't keep the momentum moving forward. He should have been where kings are supposed to be, but he didn't go. I don't know if he was back just sort of uh, you know, bathing and basking in his victories and boy, look at what I've done. And look, Pride was creeping in, remember, because that's one of the things that battle we fight on the mountain and about the dominant challenges with. And I don't know what he was dealing with, but he shouldn't have been where he was. He was losing momentum. And then Bathsheba came in the picture, adultery. Her husband Uriah was put to the front lines and murdered because of him trying to cover up his sin. You see, sin is a momentum killer. Sin is a momentum killer. And it's not just the sins of doing what you ought not to do. It's also the sin of not doing what you should be doing. His sin started when kings go forth to battle. He didn't do what he ought to have done. And because he didn't do what he ought to have done, he began to do what he ought to have not done. And long before you'll do what you should not do, you'll stop doing what you should do. That's why it's so dangerous to look at what you should be doing that you're not doing because you're setting an environment to begin doing what you should not do. And so David, we find him in this, and so sin uh, caused him to lose his momentum. We see him committing adultery, Bathsheba, murdering Uriah, her husband. Sin is a momentum killer. Obedience is a key to reestablishing spiritual momentum. But after David confessed his sin and repented, he was brought back into the momentum. True repentance is the reigniting of the momentum after you turn away from a sin and come back to God. Uh, you see, if you call the Lord and say, Lord, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I'm sorry. God's faithful and just to forgive us and get us back on track. And guess what? Reignite that motion that can then become, again, momentum in your life. But the hardest part is to start again, to move again. Let the devil beat you up and say, well, why should God use you? Why should God do this? And why should God do that? And that we see that, uh, that that's one of the biggest challenges that David fought. And so uh, we see a plane cannot take off without momentum. It doesn't matter how big an engine's in that plane. It doesn't matter how long and nice a runway is or all the things that are decked out in this plane that it has. If it doesn't get enough momentum, it's not flying. It's not getting off the ground. And do you understand tonight, no matter how uh, much uh, you'd like to soar and uh, get off the ground, uh, you won't get it unless you get momentum. And God designed us for momentum. God designed us for momentum. And I'll end on this verse right here, uh, to take off and soar. Because Isaiah says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run 
They'll run. What are they doing? Oh, they're, they're, they're starting and, they, and they'll not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Oh, what are they doing? They're building up momentum. You got to start the walking. And then that walking turns into running. And that running begins to build up some momentum. And you build up some momentum and you rise above. And you soar where the eagle soar. And you get out of your depression and your discouragement and your sinfulness. And you soar where you once soared before. But you'll never soar above the clouds. You'll never soar above the storm unless you get the movement going and that movement creates momentum don't stop what you've started because that's going to create the momentum you need to soar and so often we start in our Christian life is start, stop, start, stop oh the Christian life is so hard it is hard living it that way try moving, pushing a stationary car every day but you get that car moving a little bit a much weaker person than you, a lot less effort is needed to keep that car pushing. Keep it moving. And, but the hard part is what? Getting it started. And so many Christians, they start and stop their Bible reading. And they start their soul reading and they stop. And they start their tithing and they stop. And they start their walk with God. And they start their decision and they stop. They start and stop. They start. And they say, just so hard to live the Christian life. You got it. Because you're not taking the law of, of, of motion and the law of uh, a moving forward momentum. You're not taking advantage of the hard part it is to start. But once you're started moving, keep it going. Because it's going to get a lot easier easier because of momentum. So as we've started this revival, as we've started this revival, God is moving in our hearts. And the hardest part is for him to get us to move. And now that we're moving, don't come to a stop and have to be start all over again because you do that in your Christian life, you're going you're gonna to fizzle out. You're going to say, I just can't do this. And you're right. Who can live the Christian life always going from stop to start to stop to start and stop to start? Because the hardest part is getting started. But once you start moving an area, once you start moving in your Bible, once you start moving your faithful church then, once you start moving, then let's keep the momentum going. And that momentum will take away your extra effort that you need. I, I was sorry to get ahead of myself. It takes 80% of the fuel propulsion to get a rocket in orbit. It only needs 20% of that fuel to keep it in orbit. So when they fill up that rocket, 80% of the fuel, that's why they drop off things as they go off, go, go higher and higher. Because 80%, the weight, 80% of a rocket, it has to get up out of the, the atmosphere. It's got to get up and out. But it takes 80% to get started. But once it's started, it only needs 20% of the fuel to keep it orbiting, to keep it Momentum has taken over. And once momentum takes over, boy, it makes living the Christian life so much more enjoyable, so much more easier, so much less drudgery and hard because you're using momentum to your advantage. Father, help us tonight, Lord, to take.